Welcome to this edition of The High Strangeness Factor. I am your host, Steve Ward. On The High Strangeness Factor, we explore all aspects of the paranormal with a special emphasis on the underlying, sometimes hidden connections between what seem to be different aspects of the paranormal. My guest on this episode is Missy Lamontagne. Missy and her husband, Shane, and their two children are a normal family living in New Hampshire that has experienced something truly extraordinary. And uh, Missy, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? Great. I'm, I'm glad you're here. I, I have. I feel very comfortable in calling you uh, a normal family, even though we haven't met face to face. Right. But uh, <laughs> you and I have spoken on the phone several times. So yeah. I, I will go out on a limb and say that you're a normal family. I have a, uh, a friend of mine, John Tinney, who uh, is in the paranormal and has his own uh, website. I think it's uh, weirdlectures.com. He sells the, the best t-shirts. And one of my favorites is, it says, being uh, being human is weird, which, yes, I, is. I, 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 which I enjoy wearing sometimes. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so what, what I want to do is uh, just talk a, just a little bit about you and your family and what, what kind of work do you and your husband do? Um, I'm just a manufacturer. I've always done manufacturing, um, waitressing work. My husband's a mechanic. His specialty okay. is transmission. So just your basic living week to week. And you guys are in the uh, uh, Manchester area, New Hampshire. Yeah, we're about 40 minutes from Boston, Mass. Okay. Uh, are you in a uh, uh, more of a rural area, or are there a lot of houses around where you are? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of houses. The town's okay. grown. It's really and grown. And you're, you're in a cul-de-sac, too. You're at a... Yep. a and does that, does that help with the uh, level of traffic? Or is it kind of quiet? Yes, because we know who's coming up the road. I mean, you know, when you're living in a little cul-de-sac like this, you know all the neighbors. And we're lucky. It's all my husband's family. He grew up in this house. So, you know, he's got cousins across the street next door. It's, you know, oh, LaMontagne cool. Lane, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, lucky there. And you also, you said you lived in these, these uh, near power lines? Yes. Yep. Are those, are those, those giant ones you see? Yes. The big, big structures that go down. Do they ever bother you? Do you ever hear the hum or anything like that? Or is um, it just something that's there? I think it's just something that's here. I never really noticed, honestly, a hum. I mean, if I have, I honestly, I've just lived here for so long now. You just get used to it or you don't really even pay attention to it, honestly. You know, um, we and go walking have... through there. So there's a trail, the line. So, yeah. Yeah. You must. Uh, so if uh, usually if somebody comes cruising down your street, they're lost. And then yes. they're, they're upset that they did, didn't see the uh, the uh, what is it? The no exit sign or the exactly. Uh, the, oh, it's right. usually a pizza delivery person. That's lost. <laughs> that's, that's pressed for time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, you also have two sons at home. Uh, yeah. Wyatt and Cameron. And yes. uh, they're living at home now. OK. Yeah, uh, Wyatt's 17. He's graduating this year. Um, he's going to be joining the service. He's going to be going in the Marines. Actually. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, enlisting. I, I, so. I, I spent uh, a few years in the Navy. And yeah. uh, I even got up to New Hampshire occasionally because I was, oh. uh, I was uh, stationed. Well, yes, I was stationed yep. in uh, uh, New London, Connecticut. But we had a shipyard period for a little over a year up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And of course, you have to go into Kittery, Maine to yeah. get to, to Portsmouth. And uh, occasionally, I had my little Honda Civic. We would, uh, me and the guys would uh, get the heck away from the base and we'd go cruising up in Maine or New Hampshire. And, oh, yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful area. It really is. 
my wife and I have been to, through the White Mountains. She had never seen that before. So Oh, uh, that's pretty up there. Oh, yeah. Especially it's, it's, during the foliage. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, very pretty. But although, living although, here, you take that stuff for granted, I guess, you know? Yes, yeah, so but do you take the heavy snow for granted as well? No. I, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we just had another storm, as a matter of fact. So. Yes, yes, and so do we. I think uh, sometimes we uh, here in the Midwest get hit the same time you guys do. Yes. Usually I think you guys get it a couple days sometimes before. I lived in Iowa for a while. So, okay. yeah. But uh, but anyway, the re- reason uh, I'm just going to say briefly, the reason I wanted to bring up the the, the sort of the uh, that you're just an average family is that you're, you're familiar with the Betty and Barney Hill case. Uh, yeah. The, the couple that were abducted in New Hampshire in 61 and pretty much all the listeners are going to be, too. Uh, they uh, very credible people. Uh, they went to Dr. Benjamin Simon, who uncovered some memories that they had. And uh, back in those days, they even uh, it, it hit the mainstream media. I mean, it was in Look magazine and so forth. Yeah, but it they did a they, quick. yes, they did a film, uh, a made-for-TV movie. I don't know if you ever saw it, uh, the UFO incident. I it believe had, I did. It had James Earl Jones yep. as uh, yep as uh, Barney Hill and yep. Stella Parsons, and. Uh, you know, there's, there's even a little connection. There. We're going to be talking a little bit about Linda Moulton Howe later. But uh, Linda Moulton Howe got a hold of, a few years ago, the actual tapes of Betty and Barney Hill and played yeah. them on Coast to Coast AM one time. And it was remarkable because James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons, uh, they they must have heard those tapes because they got the the uh, inflection in the voice. Uh, Estelle Parson got, you know, Betty's uh, New England accent perfectly. It was flawless. Yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> yeah. That New England accent. <laughs> well, I, I don't uh, I don't do accents. I, I, I don't even try. Because you are I, who you yeah. are. That's right. I, I see it in the Midwest. We think we all speak normally. So there you go. Yeah. But <laughs> But the reason I bring it up is that uh, we we had kind of an informal UFO group at the time, and I think this must have been 1976. And so we were watching this on live TV back in the days when you actually had to be there to watch something. Yeah. You actually had to sit through the commercials to uh, to watch the rest of the show. But our sort of de facto leader named Lloyd, as we're watching this, he said, you know, do you guys see what they're doing here? And we said, what do you mean? And he said, they're, they're spending a lot of time showing you how normal Betty and Barney Hill are. The The teleplay was excellent. You know, they didn't just go for the the spacecraft and the aliens. Yeah. They yep. really, really, and I just made me think of you guys. How Just average it, people. Just Exactly. Not asking for it, that's for sure. That's right. And mm-hmm. uh, it's really great uh that you've come forward with this because I, I'm sure, I know you've already talked about it, but I'm sure that people will be helped by you coming forward with your experience. I hope so. If more and more, you know, come forward, I mean, we have the internet and everything else now with technology, but there's also, unfortunately, a lot of falls too out there. So, and when something like this does happen, all you want is answers. That's it. That's all you want is why, is why. Right. And why. Why, why were you chosen? And yeah. And as we get into this, we'll, we'll, uh, people will see how, uh, how objective you are about the whole thing. I mean, you have, uh, it seems to, seems to me the perfect balance between uh, uh, being open-minded and, and skeptical of what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It, let's, it, yeah. Uh, let's go back to, I think it was February 19th. Yep, it was a Sunday morning. Okay. To tell us what happened like with the first incident that you experienced. Well, my husband Shaw is a uh, he's always been an early bird. He's always up three, four in the morning. He's always in bed seven o'clock at night. That's just his routine. So he was up that morning, he was at the kitchen window having his coffee and a cigarette, and he noticed lights and he came into the bedroom and he said missy get up he said there's weird lights outside and i had fallen back to sleep so he came in a second time and he said hurry up get up you're gonna miss it so i knew it was important to him so i got up and i remember looking at the clock on the microwave and it 
read it was like four twelve in the morning and I was like not too pleased because that's the only day I could sleep in <laughs> <laughs> on a Sunday and I was like really you're gonna wake me up at four in the morning to look at lights well I looked um and out in the horizon it looked just like headlights bright white it looked like headlights on a car or a truck like those halogen really bright and I was like wow like you're speechless we live two miles from the Manchester Regional Airport so we're used to planes and helicopters and everything else so you get used to you know you kind of know what's what and if that looks odd you know it's not right so you're you're very used to conventional aircraft. And yeah. So it's really, really stood yeah. out as something different. Yes, and Shaw noticed it right away. And um, like I said, he came and got me, and I looked. So we decided to go outside on our porch, you know, for a better view to see what the heck it was. Well, Shaw's standing in front of me, and I had my arms around, wrapped around him. I could feel his heart just pounding. So I could tell he was nervous. And I said, oh, babe, don't worry about it. I said, it's probably military or something like that. And I remember telling him, go get your phone. And he said, I can't move. Well, besides that, this part, I'm still having a hard time trying to digest and just understand itself is the next moment I was on the other side of the porch by myself. I had my head back and I remember my arms slightly out to my side because I remember thinking in my head, because I remember putting my arms down to my side thinking, why, I don't stand like that. People don't stand like that. Why is my head all the way back? Why am I putting my arms to my side? Like that's weird. And above my head was this huge black triangle. No noise at all no engine sound, nothing. It was like um, a subwoofer, like a hum. Okay. If that makes sense. Do you know if Shaw was still paralyzed at this point? Not at this point. Um, it was going overhead to the left, to the right underneath it. I saw two or three tiny, tiny red lights. And that was on the right side underneath it. And on the left side were like grates. Does that, do you understand what I mean? But like, yes. okay, like opening, like grates. That's exactly what it looked like. So it was low enough. You saw a very specific. Oh detail. yeah. Right. I could have thrown a rock at it. Did you say that it was uh, so low that it seemed to be touching some of the, the tops of tree. the trees? Okay. Yeah, it glided the uh, pine tree in the front yard. It was huge. I could not believe how massive. Um, and it moved and, really slow. My husband said it took a good five to 10 minutes just to go a quarter mile. And, and then tell us what happened. It was, it was quite, uh, uh, your, your reactions to it were quite odd. For yeah, the, for very the odd to see something like that. It hadn't even finished going over our house. And I remember putting my head forward. I remember turning my head, looking at Shaw, he looking at me, and we both walked into the, in the house like nothing happened. You saw what I saw, yep, you saw what I saw, and that was it. Like, I watch hey. a balloon in the sky, like to see where that goes. We're not, any person would, this is massive to not watch and see where it goes. Right. Well, this is uh, something that it seems to be uh, not uncommon in some of these, the, the reactions, the uh, the sort of uh, nonchalant. nonchalant. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and so that's that actually goes to your credibility. You know, somebody making up a story would, might tell it all differently. But mm -hmm. uh, so that's, yeah, that's just really interesting. And then when was it that you uh, you figured out that you had missed some time? Um, I was sitting in the recliner. Now, when every, when we first saw the lights, well, when Shaw had first, when I had gotten out of bed, 
to look. It was still dark out. The sun hadn't come up yet. So when the craft was over, when I saw it coming over my head, when it was overhead, now it started, it was, the sun had started coming up. So it was like dust. You could make out the trees, but the sun wasn't all the way out. So I'm sitting in the recliner and I'm looking and I happen to look at the clock and it was 447. There was okay. no possible way in New England. And that was a mild winter, even though that was a mild winter, it's still cold especially four o'clock in the morning with no coats in pajamas. There's no way we were out there for a half hour. Not possible. And then what, uh, tell us, uh, I know that you, uh, it, it, this really bugged you. You wanted to know yeah. what happened. And I think you pursued several uh, attempts to be, uh, to find a hypnotherapist that could uh, maybe un you know, possibly unlock some memories that you might've had. Yeah, well, I mean, when something like this happens, I mean, seriously, there's really no emergency numbers for anything like this. Right. And I wasn't going to call the local police, the authorities. Shaw, number one, he's like, no. He's like, no way. He's like, they'll think we're freaking nuts. Don't know. He's like, just let it be. Let it be. So I ended up finding Graystar Paranormal. And his name is Jonathan. Um, I didn't realize either at the time that paranormal, I always thought paranormal was just like ghosts, um, exorcisms, right? stuff. You don't really think of UFOs, or I did in any way, as with the paranormal. So anyway, I had found his site, and I saw that it said like UFO sightings and stuff like that. So I called him and um, I had called him, I told him what happened and then I had hung up and then I remember I had called him back and I said, uh, cause he had asked me if we thought we had time missing time. And I, at first I was like, well, I don't know, you know, thinking about it. And then I remember I had called him right back within 10 minutes and I said, well, I don't understand. I explained what happened that it was, you know, four o'clock in the morning and then it's 447. It's pitch black out and then the sun's coming up and we see it in the horizon. And then all of a sudden it's over my head. And he said, yeah, that's missing time. And I'm standing on the other side of the porch. I didn't know how I got there. I didn't remember walking over there. I wouldn't have walked over there. I wouldn't have left Shaw. My whole body was like wrapped around him. I was scared and he was scared. So I certainly wouldn't have left him. Well, so. he, he asked the right questions. Uh, that was a uh, gray star. You said, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it seemed like they did. Uh, they did some investigations in your house and so forth. And were, were very yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Him and his team came out. Um, oh gosh, we did a questionnaire, both shot in myself over 200 questions and they said we answered everything correctly, I guess, or they continued with us. Right. So, and they also recorded video recorded, um, our first session. Okay. Um, yeah. So how do so, you really investigate something like this though? Well, exactly. Like you know, I, I never, you know, people, there's a, uh, I think Peter Davenport is a guy that runs a, uh, UFO reporting uh, place up in Washington State, and he's always uh, railing on people to you. You've got to report, uh, well, at least report it to his his uh, uh, database uh, group or whatever. Yeah, which yeah. I guess is okay. But he's also talking about you know reporting it to the authorities. I would never report personally. No. As someone who's who's been investigating this for a long time, <clears throat> I would never uh, go to the authorities. No, uh, just. Uh, no, I just, no, I couldn't. Well, number one, my husband didn't, you know, he said, no, 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 don't call. Don't. He's like, no, yeah. we don't yeah, need I, that. I'm with him because occasionally you're going to get a hold of somebody that will listen <clears throat> and will give you some credence. But for the most part, it's, uh, you know, 
you know, well, did you it's see you know, the Green Man? Yes, it is. Yeah. It's giggle factor. It's like when you watch the uh, a news broadcast and somebody has seen a UFO, they'll save it for the end and use it for a little giggle on, yeah. on the very I end. I did call our local news, though. That I will. I did call News 9, WMUR. Okay. Just to ask if there were any sightings. Oh, that was a good because idea. Because it went right over the flight pattern. You oh. know, that path. We're two miles, like I said, from the airport. So it was right in the flight path. And I know their radar, I would assume, had to pick it up. Uh, sometimes uh, people have seen, <clears throat> I actually talked to an air traffic controller. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Just give me a second here. Okay. Had to hit the old cough button. Um, uh, this lady, she and one of her coworkers saw uh they were in uh, New York, I think, upstate New York. Anyway, they saw some strange lights. Here they are, air traffic controllers. They see it. They call the tower and they say, are you seeing anything on radar? And they saw nothing. So you had wow. two people that were actually seeing these these lights. They're off at a distance. But so sometimes, but on the other hand, there are some classic sightings where uh, uh, there is a people, they call them radar visual, where somebody, they see that the object's on the ground and there's also confirmation on radar. So there just doesn't seem to be a, a good, uh, you, you can't count on any particular trend. It's, it's always different. I, I just right. wonder if, uh, have you, have you ever seen a UFO prior to this? No. Okay. So this was no, the first time. I have as seen, as... um, I have seen like, I guess, ghosts. That's what you want to call them. Spirits oh, okay. or whatever. When being younger, I have, but I didn't realize what it was until after the fact. Well, sometimes it seems that I, now, now I, I quote to John Keel all the time, the author of the Mothman Prophecies, and he found that certain people seem to be uh, um, prone to see their, their, their he, he, way he put it was like more could open. See, Yes, well, a little. They could see a little further into the the spectrum, so to speak. They're uh, either psychic or have latent psychic abilities, and those same people will sometimes experience ghostly phenomena and see UFOs and so forth. It isn't uh, so much that people will uh, just see one thing. Um, now, the the uh, uh, the group did they did they take some readings or something at your house? Did they find anything or? Yeah, they took. Um, I guess. You know, like the EMF right. readings and stuff like that. They said everything came out fine. It wasn't, they thought where the power lines, oh, it, right. I guess the readings would be odd or wacky. I mean, the readings, it did go crazy up by the power lines because they did go up there. Right. Because there were uh, odd sightings also up in the power lines. Oh, Okay. Yeah, I've checked, uh, I've used an EMF meter in uh, the Point Pleasant area around power lines, and they will, and even if you're way down to the ground, they will they will uh, register uh, yeah. A, yeah. a result. So uh, you tried uh, tried several different attempts at that point to uh, find a hypnotherapist that could, could work for you. And at that point in time, you were completely unsuccessful. Isn't that right? Yeah. It, um, Jonathan, he obviously, he... He was himself, which he found very odd because he had done numerous cases where he had worked, you know, with his clients and getting them help to find people to do regression. And I said, yeah, I'll try it. I told him I was open to it. But he literally could not find anybody at all. He was not getting anywhere. And he just found that odd odd things were happening to him so he kind of backed off for a little bit because he was actually getting sick him huh. like physically sick so oh, that's interesting yeah and he found that very odd um but he said i guess it's it has happened to him before with another client that it was a legit it was a it, legit case. yeah a legit experience and he said, you know, the same thing pretty much had happened prior. So uh, no, the I, first few times okay. I had gone, nothing, I couldn't get anywhere. I don't know if I was just too tense or nervous. Well, well that happens. And when, when I first talked to you, I, I thought that might be it because some people really aren't uh, good uh, 
uh, subjects. Now, I know uh, Shaw was not interested in being uh, hypnotized. No, and this is, it's funny because Shaw and I both flipped. He was always, I don't want to say like always into UFOs, but he would watch the shows and he was, you know, interested, thought it was cool, neat. Well, ever since that happened, he wants nothing. He doesn't care. It happened. Let it be. He doesn't care about learning about anything, wanting to know nothing. He's just shut down. And well, you know, I'm the I, one. I, I kind of uh, I, I, I've been uh, empathizing with Shaw this whole time. I wouldn't have, you know, I, I don't think I would have called anybody. Uh, yeah. and, and also, I, I'm. Uh, I had a situation once where it's remotely possible I had a little bit of missing time, probably not, but I don't I don't know that I would uh, pursue that avenue. So I can I can completely understand that. And and then there was a point where I, I guess you had seen me on Facebook and yeah. decided to call me. Yeah. And uh, that's when we first talked and you told me your story. And at that point, you now later on, people will, will find out you did make a breakthrough with with the hypnosis thing. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, so uh, we had a conversation. And uh, uh, what I want to tell people is that, uh, uh, you know, I've been doing this at least as a, as a hobby since the 1960s. And back in those days, I also didn't. Uh, connect ghosts and uh, UFOs and all these things together. I was a UFO guy, had no no interest or patience for ghost stories or, or yeah. anything like that. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but but later on, that's changed with, with some of the, the research and so forth of John Keel, that's changed. Yeah. So, uh, but but since then, now John Keel, he had sort of a catchphrase. He, he called it, he said, ask the the experiencer, what they had for breakfast. And of course, he wasn't speaking literally. What yeah. he meant was, find out about the individual. So I asked you a series of really weird questions at yep. that time. And it yep. turned out that there were a lot of other things that have happened to you uh, before and yep. after the, and the incident. And, and yes, also and Shaw, Shaw growing and, up. And, 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 you're, and oh, Shaw, okay, we'll get to try and get to that too. By the way, if we, we may not be able to get to everything, and I, I would love to have you come back sometime. Yeah. Because uh, your experience is fascinating. But anyway, we still have some plenty of time. Uh, I asked you if, uh, because uh, of the research of Rosemary Ellen Guiley, she found that uh, she was studying shadow people one time. People oh, really yeah. have these, these experiences. Uh, and she found that a significant percentage of those people were also experiencing uh, abduction phenomena like you did. Wow. And then you, you told me you had a shadow person yep. experience. It was and, at, um, I was working at a manufacturing place and I had gone there early in the morning. It was a Saturday morning. I, yeah, I want to say it was an early Saturday morning and I was going to meet my supervisor there to finish some work that we had had, you know, prior that week. So in those places, it's really bright. It's fluorescent lights and the walls were all white, you know, so it, it's really bright in there. I went in and I'm sitting there at the desk. I was waiting for my boss to get there and still waiting. And then all of a sudden, you know, when you feel like somebody's coming in or, you know, you get that feeling like somebody's there. Well, I looked, I turned and I saw a person, a shadow on the wall and it was a man and he had a coat a long coat like a raincoat and one of those like a is it a fedora hat yes fedora right yeah well i was like oh well someone's here so i saw the shadow go into one of the rooms and i walked into one of the rooms thinking that he was gonna walk out well, there's only one way and one way out in this room. Well, he didn't come out. So then I'm like, well, wait a minute. So then your mind starts thinking like, well, what was that? Because I know I saw a figure, a person. Right. But then That's... again, I didn't hear footsteps or anything. Okay, that's that's classic. They some people call him the Hat Man. People see these shadow people wearing hats and so forth. And I don't, I don't, you know, maybe it's uh, 
Maybe it's just an offshoot of an apparition or, or a ghost. I, I don't know. But very. I was out of there. I called. Yes, uh, well, I, I don't. I don't blame you. And this happened uh, before the UFO incident. Oh, way incident. before. Way I before. Say okay. This happened. I want to say eight or nine years ago. Okay. The, the, the time factor isn't that important because uh, uh, certain people just seem to be experiencers. Now, I've had, you know, very little in the way of experiences. I mean, I could, I could tell you my life story of, of paranormal happenings in five minutes if I was speaking slowly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now also uh, your sons have experienced, uh, well, you said, you said Shaw Orb. has uh, ex, ex, orbs. Oh, that's right. Let's talk about the orbs. They, they well, both Shaw's have, right? actually experienced the same thing when he was young. He was about uh, eight or nine years old. And his cousin Dana was living here at the house with them. And I think Dana was like 12 and Shaw's sister, Marsha, she was like 12 or 13. In the backyard, they saw a, a huge white orb. And it was just hovering there in the backyard. He said it was humongous. And all three of them saw it. And I think it was that Marsha ran to go get mom and by the time the parents came into the bedroom, he said it just ping, just took off towards the power lines. And they saw it go out towards the power lines and then ping, ping up to the sky. Wow. So uh, you, you said Shaw has been in this house his whole life. Yep. Yeah. Okay. He was born here. So the, 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 you might say the house or the area itself has uh, been a... Yes, odd or a, I don't know, a, an attractor of paranormal phenomena, or maybe it's always been there, even before the house was built. Right. Hard to say. Yeah. Uh, now, both your sons have experienced orb phenomena. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yes. Yeah. Cameron was, um, I want to say he was around two, two and a half, maybe a little older. He was sleeping with Shaw and I. He Never wanted to sleep by himself. He just recently actually started sleeping alone, and he's going to be 12. He was always afraid, always. Um, he had woken up. He was in between us, and he had told us that he was looking out the window on the right-hand side that's in between the house and our garage. There's like a walkway, a path there. And he said that it was an orange, orangey-red ball of light. And he said it was kind of playing with him, like peekaboo. Mm -hmm. And he was just watching it. And then he said it just zoomed away. And I said, oh, Kim, I said, that was probably taillights you saw, honey. Don't you think I know the difference? Uh -huh. well, <laughs> he's very smart. So he knew, you know, he saw what he saw. And um, my son, Wyatt. Wyatt is 17 now. I want to say Wyatt was 14 or 15 when this happened. Him and I were rearranging the living room. And it was probably about midnight, 1 o'clock in the morning. It was just Wyatt and I. Well, I had him bring some speakers or boxes or something downstairs to the basement. Well, he came flying up the stairs and, like, just about fell through the door. And I'm thinking, typical teenager, you know. <laughs> he never said anything. It took him over a year before he actually ever said anything to Shaw and I about what he saw downstairs. Uh, he said he was downstairs putting the speakers away. And he said from under the staircase came a white ball of light. He said it came out from under the staircase. It went by his feet very slowly in front of him hovered like circling a little round and round until it made it up to in front of his face and it hovered there for a little bit and then it slowly zoomed over to it went around the washer it went around the dryer and then it went in between the washer and the dryer through the concrete wall and made like a suction wow yeah and they've also uh, both experienced haunting phenomena in the house, apparitions Just, or that sort of thing? Yeah, Cameron more than Wyatt. Um, Cameron would see, like, creepy things, he would say, creepy people. Uh, he didn't really get too much into it. He would just shut it down. 
But he also would see when he was really little, he would always talk about certain people that he liked their colors. And I didn't understand what he was talking oh. about. Yeah. So he was seeing auras then. Yeah. Yeah. But he's grown out. He hasn't spoken really of anything in a long time. So. That, that's, that happens a lot, too. Is sometimes, uh, as you know, young children seem to be much more sensitive and experience these things. And as they get older, uh, you know, it just kind of goes away. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what I would have done if I, I never really experienced anything like that when I was a kid. Yeah, was, me neither. I was afraid of the of going down to the basement alone. You know? Yeah, me too. Like that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I'll, but if I had, you know, something extra to be concerned about, uh, I, I don't know how I would have processed it. Well, but, I feel uh, bad because I kind of, sh I feel guilty as a mom because I didn't really pay attention. And it took Wyatt a good couple of years before he would even go down to the basement again. Well, it's, it's hard when, uh, a, you know, my wife is sensitive and uh, she has been all her life. And it's, it's, uh, it's hard when you're not somebody that's tuned into that and yeah. other people are. It's kind of hard to process and it takes, it, it took me a while for it to kind of sink in, you know, that yeah. it's, it's something real and, and something that goes on. Uh, I just wish, I guess he would have said something instead of suffering with this. Right. Uh, I think it's just normal. I mean, it, yeah. it's, uh, kids are, you know, embarrassed, uh, yeah. about the, 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 I mean, kids get, uh, have enough trouble. Right. Just, exactly. Just, just a regular life that, but you add something like this on and this is, this is another great reason why you're coming forward is because other families will hear this that have children that have had experiences like this and they can talk to them and, you know, with, with some degree of understanding right. of what might have happened to them. Now, I, I remember, uh, I'm not sure how many of these we'll get to because uh, pretty soon I want to get to your experience and what was revealed. But I, I asked uh, a lot of these so-called John Keel questions. And one of them, I, I said, I remember saying to you that I know this is going to sound weird, but sometimes people that have these UFO experiences have also seen some kind of a cryptid, like a Bigfoot or whatever. And you said, well, no, you hadn't. But then you thought of somebody in your family that had seen something yep. strange. Actually, and, and... it was um, my mother-in-law. She lives in Arizona now, and Shaw's sister, Marsha, and her cousin, her name is Missy also. Well, Shaw's mom saw it. It was a black panther, half panther, half man. I guess the lower part was like a man. Like, so it was literally standing upright when they saw yeah, it. Yeah, it was um, leaning against a tree, and there's and how, a path. How close was this to your house? Uh, very close. I'm actually looking at the path right now. Oh, I'm okay. So it's standing right in front of the kitchen window that I. So, so all these things are really happening in the same proximity. Yep. Yep. And then, so what? What happened? How did they react? Um, I don't know if she. Well, I don't know how she really reacted then. Honestly, it was I mean so many years ago, but she never said anything. I don't think to the kids. Obviously, they were young, but. Marsha Shaw's sister and her cousin Missy saw it years later oh. the same thing it wasn't like they all saw it together it was years later did Marcia they see and it Missy to, saw it did they see it in different areas or was it in the, in the same general area it was in the same general area I don't know if it was like the same tree but it was the same path and they I went flying they saw the panther half man it was a black panther half man leaning against the tree and they just freaking flew, I guess, running. Now, you know, it didn't, I would too. Sound like a dumb question, but did, what did it have clothes on or was it just like a creature with the, the fur and so forth? I think they said it was just like a creature. They okay. didn't notice clothes or anything. They just couldn't believe what they were seeing. Well, well, that's interesting because I haven't actually heard a report like that, but there are many of what they call these, uh, 
black cat sightings, these giant black cats that, and there aren't supposed to be any panthers or black panthers, you know, no. anywhere in the U.S. No. Nope. And but uh, most of those are on all fours, although they're very credible sightings. And then we have, uh, well, especially here in Michigan, we have what they call the Michigan dog man, and many many credible people. In fact, a lady, a researcher I know named Linda Godfrey, has uh, wrote her first book called The Beast of Bray Road, where she started documenting these upright canids. Wow. And uh, uh, very, very credible reports. Uh, some of them have been seen in uh, just a matter of miles from where I live. Now, of course, I've never seen anything like that. But it sounds kind of a, a similar uh, similar category. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, every once in a while, uh, you know, you'll get your, your basic Bigfoot reports. You'll get... Uh, uh, you know, people report the, the Jersey Devil and so forth. Every once in a while, you'll get something that seems to be a little bit of an aberration like the, the upright panther. Now, there may be more in the literature that I don't, don't know about, but yeah. that's, that's really interesting that several different people saw this over a period of time. And they've all said the same exact makings or markings, the same. Their story was exactly the same. So... Yeah, it stayed with them, you know, forever. It's when you have an experience, like any type of experience that makes you scratch your head, it sticks with you and you question your own sanity. Oh, I sure. Mean, and and you keep it to yourself. I mean, you might tell your family or close friends, but you know, the last thing you're going to do is bring it up in in conversation. Yeah. Uh, over breakfast or something like that with some yeah friends. see i think that's where i drive shaw crazy is he's like you just talk way too much <laughs> i wouldn't want you on my side if there was a war <laughs> <laughs> yes loose lips sink ships yes for sure. he's like you gotta stop but i want answers and i know exactly what happened for myself i know what i saw i know what i experienced and that's not normal for me at all and it scares, you know, it's scary, even to this day. I still think about it every day, every single day. So uh, finally, you're uh, uh, the uh, gentleman from Graystar. What was his name again? Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Did, was he the one that recommended a, uh, a therapist when you finally made a breakthrough? To, Actually, uh, no, that was um, my doctor, my oh, okay. physician. All yeah, right. he... I happened to actually have an appointment with him that Monday. So we had that experience that happened Sunday. So I saw him that Monday. I was a wreck. He's known me for a long time and I broke down bad. And I mean, I feel like he believed me. He, when I see him, he still asks me questions, you know, how I'm doing and he told me about some friends that he had that had experiences themselves or, you know. So he gave me a number of a friend that is that I guess is a psychiatrist and also does the hypnosis. Right. But I think he more generally would do like to lose weight, stop smoking, stuff like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So... He was just as intrigued, I guess, as I was trying to try it again, see what happens. I was well, just... You, you were very fortunate. Your your family doctor uh, sent you to somebody yeah. that was uh, not only qualified and a professional, they were very much open to helping you and not, uh, you know, brushing you off as some kind, somebody that's, uh, uh, I don't know, just yes. imagining things. Which he could have right away. I mean, I don't know what I would have done if it was the other way around, honestly. Well, you know, Benny and Barney Hill, when they went to Dr. Benjamin Simon, I guess his uh, expertise was uh, uh, he helped people that uh, had been in the war and uh, had bad memories of, oh, of okay. you know, being in battle and so forth. Like a and PTSD so, type? Yes. And uh, probably before they were calling it that. Yeah. And so he would take people back and it would help them overcome their their bad memories and their fear and so forth. So he wasn't, you know, he certainly wasn't known as a uh, abduction researcher. I mean, now there are people that do specialize in that. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, and tell this guy us... wasn't either. Oh, right. Good. 
So, no. so, so he, he was probably, I would imagine then he was not somebody that was going to be asking leading questions. You know, he was probably very objective. Some, yeah. I mean, they've said that sometimes people under hypnosis, if they're asked very leading questions, you know, they can kind of partially form the experience that may not yeah. be completely real, but it sounds like uh, this guy not really being part of that was uh, such a much more objective approach. Yo, definitely. No, he was very, very professional. Um, it's hard for me to, with the regression, honestly, because I don't know if I have that stuff there from watching shows, watching movies, the internet, speaking to other people. That wasn't my reality, like seeing and experiencing the craft right that was reality that was real a hundred percent so that's another thing in, in my discussions with you I've, that's always impressed me that you're uh very uh you're not ready to just believe no that, not at this all is the, right you you know because you you don't have any conscious memories of it you you know that you know, something happened you lost time there's yep. something mysterious going on but why don't you just go ahead and tell us what the hip, hypno, uh, hypno, hypnosis was it just one session by the way yeah where you made it was the breakthrough just the one it okay was just that one session um so he took me back to the time and the day and everything and i felt like i was really here um I could feel myself being lifted away from Shaw and I, but I didn't have that. I had the falling feeling for like a split second. I knew I was being lifted and then I was fine. It was like, I was okay. And then all of a sudden I was laying on a table, like a medical table in a medical room, but the room okay. was round. Um, now, apparently, it seems like even though Shaw wasn't put under regressive hypnosis, it doesn't sound like he was part of this. No, he wasn't. Okay. He just, and what's kind of odd, too, is we both have to agree to disagree because his experience was totally different than my experience. We saw the same thing, but we both have two different encounters i guess if that's how you want to yes. say it and that's not uncommon either i know i know some people personally that had a strange experience that is very similar in many respects even you know even betty and barney hill while their experience was very similar uh some of the facial features of the what they called the aliens were a little different so that's also not unusual to have that oh. kind of a different perspective well, to save our marriage, we both have to just agree to disagree. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's so. true with all marriages, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> but um, I remember I was laying on a table, and to my left hand side, I'm laying on the table, and when I would turn my head to the left, there was this creepy, ugly thing kept going into my face, looking in my face, like putting his face right directly into my face he had he was more white whitish silver that color okay not really gray he was more like a white like white silvery was he sort of like a gray but um, on a lighter color or yeah. was something different okay yeah he you know the big black creepy eyes and yep okay a mean looking face very mean <laughs> okay. looking face I don't know if that makes sense, but just real yes. creepy. Okay. Um, he, I want to say he was maybe a little under five feet tall. About okay. that. Um, but he kept putting his face into my face. And that literally just scared the crap out of me. Now, there were some other, I don't know, for lack of a better word, entities or beings in the same room there? Yeah. Um, to my right was, she felt very motherly. She was beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. She was very tall, blonde hair, um, just beautiful. What I would think is absolutely stunning and beautiful. That's exactly what she looked like to me. And that's how she sounded. She had the sweetest voice, even though she didn't look at me and 
like talk to me, like move her lips. She was like in my mind talking to me, but she had like a very sweet, pure voice. Was she uh, being reassuring? Oh yeah, very much so. She kept telling me not to pay attention to him, to look at her. And she kept saying, now we go through this all the time. You always get upset. Just look at me. We're almost done. Like reassuring me. And it, it, implying me like, like this had happened before then. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, just telling me it's okay. Shaw's fine. He's almost done. He's okay. You know, just kept reassuring me over and over and having me look at her and not to my left. Right. But I remember looking forward and there was this real creepy looking, did you ever see Toy Story? Oh, yes. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. That spider with the baby yes. head on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what it looked like to me, except okay. it had the face or like the thing that was next to me, whatever that was, but like that, but it looked like it's more spider. Were you conscious of any kind of a medical procedure or anything like that, or you were just laying there? Just on, laying on the... there, basically. Oh, okay. Now, yeah. wasn't there something else? Uh, uh, was it more toward your feet? There was another thing That's there? That's what was towards my feet, that spider okay. looking. It was, he was oh, okay. against the wall. Oh, okay. And I kind of felt like he was telling that other, whatever it was to my left, it was like they were kind of communicating with each other. Okay. Like he was telling him or whatever what to do. Cause he kept, every time I would look to the left, turn my head to the left, I could only turn my head left or right. And every time I would turn it to the left, he would literally put his face in my face. Hmm. Ugh. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh... <laughs> I appreciate you telling us this. I know it's it can't be, it can't be easy or comfortable. But uh, yeah, uh, like I say, this I I, I guarantee this is going to be something that will help people. Uh, but that's so, not my reality. Also, that that's that's right. That's right. Because you don't really know if this no. is an objective thing that happened. One thing that's kind of interesting. I'm always looking for patterns. And uh, one of the things that, if you look back into traditional folklore, and uh, <clears throat> compare that to some like the the fairies and so forth, uh, they had missing time. Only instead of going on a UFO, they would you would end up in a the underground kingdom of the little people or a mountain or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but there's there's a lot of similarities between uh, beliefs and, and stories and folklore to some modern day UFO experiences. So uh, there is one, and this may have nothing to do with it, but oftentimes uh, when people had encounters with the little people, there would be the tall fairy queen there and oh. then the 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 uh the others the fairies or whatever sometimes not particularly attractive they would be much shorter mm -hmm. and somebody else has pointed a, a great researcher named joshua kuchin has written a book making some of these comparisons and it just struck me that uh again you know we don't know what has actually happened right but and, and it may not it, it may not even matter that it really happened it still may have a reflection on you know folklore of the past yeah. And, uh, and so forth. Um, is there is there uh, anything else that you can think of that happened during this particular experience that you think might be important? Um, no, not too much. Just we were both kind of speechless. I don't want to say the doctor's name because I didn't, you know, speak with him or get permission. But um, right. No, that's all right. I'm sure that uh, it, it's very possible he wants to. Uh, remain anonymous anyway in his yeah. practice because just because of the way that uh, people look on things like this and yeah and 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 thank you know uh, I'm I'm just so happy that uh, you had you found somebody of that caliber that was able to help you. So was I, but I don't know if I'll ever do it again. Honestly, no, I I I, I don't know that uh, you really need to pursue it. You yeah. Uh, uh, and but like uh, he said, he said memories. Good, bad, and different, whatever. He said, memories eventually will come back. Okay. It may take years. It could take a year. could take 20 years. He says, but memories, most oftentimes, will, they do come back. But that day, what was very odd, if I could tell you really quickly, oh, was sure. when I got 
into the car. I was driving home. I was going to call Jonathan from Graystar. Now, him and I had not spoken, I want to say, at least a good four, six months, maybe longer. Well, I called him because I wanted him to let, let him know what took place and how it went. Well, he was about to call me, which was we're flabbergasted with that. That's, because that's like, a synchronicity right there. But yeah, yeah, tell us, tell us what he's actually, didn't he stop you first? You, you were about to tell him yes. you had a breakthrough. And, and what did he tell you? He said, hold up, hold up, hold up. He says, I just have to tell you something really quick. He says, before you say anything, he says, I was, a, he says, I had phone in hand. He says, I was about to call you. He had a dream the night, I guess that night prior that what, ever took us he said it was the grace they had allowed him to come into our room our bedroom and showed him what had been taking place and going on i guess with essentially saying that you that yes they were uh i don't know examining you or 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 so forth and uh was it did he get the feeling like you know like don't worry uh, this is what we're doing and, uh, it's nothing to it's worry about or protocol, protocol. regular yep, procedure. It is what it is. It's and been I, happening for generations. And I think you also, I mean, I don't know that if he's, was prone to have these, uh, it was like an out of body experience because you yes. he, he described things yep. in your room exactly. that were, yeah, that were it demonstrated and that he knew. Well, it, he knew where everything was. He knew which side of the bed I slept on, which you know, 50-50, anybody could probably really get that if they wanted to guess or whatever. But what really creeped me out was he even said to a T perfectly the pajamas that I was wearing. Wow. And they were the pajamas that Shaw had actually gotten me for Christmas, that Christmas. He well, here, described them perfectly. This is... A, 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 a just a an amazing cooperation. Yeah, I mean this this helps you to know that regardless, we don't really know exactly what's going on or what it all means, but we know that something nobody's crazy here. There's something uh, substantive going on here. But if you weren't crazy before. <laughs> You probably be crazy after. Maybe maybe you'll have to get one of those T-shirts I talked about. I I would like one. I would wear it proudly. <laughs> but well, it does change a person. It truly, truly, it really does. Yes, but was I don't know imp- if we'll ever get answers, honestly. But what's always impressed me about you is how how uh, clear and lucid and forthcoming you are and thoughtful about your experience. And, oh, thank you. uh, and I really, I, I'm so happy that you uh, contacted me. I feel like we're friends and I would, uh, I do too. love to meet you guys in person sometimes. So that would be, that great. would be great. I would, re- I would enjoy that myself. Like, I don't know, just when somebody goes through this, you just really want answers. And we may, I don't know if the government will ever come out, but when I did speak with Linda, which I was surprised, she called me, um, over the summer which was actually accidentally that she called me, which is kind of funny because right. she called and she asked for a Bob. She was trying to get a hold of a man named Bob. Huh. Yeah. And I said, Oh, Linda, I said, you know, my name is Missy Lamontine. I emailed you, you emailed me, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, I really, really need to speak with Bob. I promise I will call you back, but I didn't think she was going to. And lo and behold, she did. And, um, I told her my story, what happened, and she said, as far as she knows, there's nothing in our government that would have that technology or reason yeah. why it would take uh, somebody like Sean and I have that I, happen. I, I, I agree. I mean, there, there's some rumors about these giant black triangles, and maybe they do have some, but the, the rest of the experience just doesn't make any sense at yeah. all. That's what exactly she said. So, well, yeah. Well, Missy, we're coming close to the end of our time. And okay. uh, I, I want to thank uh, you, Missy Lamontagne, for a great hour and for uh, sharing your experience with us. Oh, anytime, and, uh, Steve. And, and I hope to, to see you again soon, like I say. And uh, I also need to thank our fearless leaders at Paranormal UK Radio, Irene Allen Block, Mark Johnson, 
I also need to uh, thank my phenomenal producer, Andy Mercer, who's also my part-time co-host. The music was by Brian Zeller, and I am Steve Ward, your humble host here on the High Strangeness Factor, a displaced yank here on Paranormal UK Radio. Thanks for listening. I will see you all again in a fortnight. Take care. <laughs>